think I have to check and keep going. All right, cool. So we're on, we're on YouTube and those ones are running. Now we're going to go live on StreamYard here. What about Janky for the first go around, but we'll figure this one out. Yeah, that's a lot of windows open. I don't even know what that. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live with the first inaugural No Absolutes podcast with the one and only George Monty of the True Life podcast. Uh, we are playing with some technical stuff here today, so if it looks wonky or something, try a different uh, stream. We should be on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and one other one. So anyway, welcome, George, to the podcast. How are you today, brother? Did. How's the weather there? Always that nice 82 degrees, right? <laughs> oh, oh, my heart. <laughs> well, on that note, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself now that you made them a little bit jealous? Most excellent. Well, yeah, I met you because you invited me on your podcast. So, uh, and you're always the man with the questions. So this is a little bit of the flip of the switch here. Um, but why don't you tell a little bit about your story and kind of how you got to the point in your life where we ended up chatting every week?
Excellent. Thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. Yeah, um, for people who haven't been following along or if you're just tuning into this, uh, George and I have been getting a bit infamous over the past couple of months, uh, every Wednesday and Sunday. Uh, Sunday with a group uh, of fellow, uh, what should we call ourselves? Explorers? <laughs> I, I, probably a few more adjectives too to add into that. I'm sure. Um, and so, yeah, we've been kind of delving down many subjects. So it, it's kind of interesting to kind of try to shift gears and move into you know something that we haven't talked about. Um, but we've kind of talked about everything. So it, you know, I think we're just kind of going to move forward uh, and flavor it a little bit differently. So I think. Kind of one of the goals that I want to do with this is to kind of paint the perspective of world events and what's happening in people's lives and things around us in the philosophy of no absolutes. Um, since we've already talked about no absolutes and I have some other stuff coming down with, you know, actual like audio books and releases of that stuff uh, coming on the YouTube channels and all the other channels, I don't think we have to go into it that, that much. So... Why don't we just jump into world events today? Because they are they are quite interesting. digital currency.
That's an interesting take. I mean, you know, in that context, I think it's also important to highlight that there's just a lot of evidence that supports, you know, exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you have the World Economic Forum that has officially kind of said, set their date as 2025 for kind of a more global rollout of these systems. Uh, and then you have, you know, uh, in the United States here, our treasury is set 2025 for the central bank digital currency for the United States. Uh, you have China, who's already rolled out theirs uh, this, past, this last June, I believe. Um, so we're seeing, you know, this is where everything's going. Uh, and I think it, it ends up, there's a fly here, that's fun. Uh, it ends up, uh, it ends up heading in a direction where I, I think you alluded to it, where, you know, we're moving into the next iteration, the next phase of what we're going to be dubbing currency. Because right now it's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of the petrodollar, right? And it has been for quite some time. Uh, and now we're kind of, and since the petrodollar kind of became in play, now we're seeing the movement to, you know, through to these digital services and whatnot to the tune where it's taken over some 25% of the global marketplace, you know, since World War II-ish um, and just financial services versus uh, commodities. Uh, so, I think we're, we've already seen the shift in that, and I think that's definitely moving in that direction. Um, what what do you see happening in with the pipeline? Is that where was it sabotage? Was it who blew it up, George? Well, I think, you know, in line with what you're saying, you also have, they want to take that power away from Russia, right? Because they are the, you know, they don't want a single nation state to have that power. And I think we we talked about this a while ago on your podcast, but I, you know, I, I really think we are seeing the erosion of nation states. And I think in a lot of ways, because of, uh, you know, exactly what we're talking about, the economic situation, the, the um, dispersal of resources over the coming century, uh, but also because it's just, it's not conducive to having a, a 
a global population anymore that's connected with supply chains that run through 20 countries uh and it all of a sudden it becomes a burden instead of the security blanket that it that it once was weapons It's interesting. I think, you know, I think they're playing both sides of the of the coin here because like like they often do. If you look historically about, you know, all these conflicts and all of these social uprising events and things like this, most often the money will play both both sides just to hedge their bet essentially and maintain their control and resources. Uh I, you know, I don't see us not going towards a technocratic kind of city-state type idea um, for, you know, just because I know what can actually be made, you know, from my little angle of the world that's been automating stuff for a long period of time. And it's pretty wild stuff. I mean, as soon as you start to get some consistency in data structures with these AI systems and, the, you know, these AI vision systems and whatnot, I mean, we've already seen the videos of the social credit system in China, right? You know, you have they're being tracked all the time. You're you attached a number. You're all of a sudden you can't go to the bank and withdraw money because you you're 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 red when you when you scan your QR code. Um, and I and I think from a institutional level and also from a nationalistic level, I think that is a desired option, which. I find disturbing, you know, uh, I think the last bastion of, of where we could move away from this is in kind of the, the free oligarch system of things where, you know, there's still a potential path to, for wealth, but there has to be a third option. Otherwise, you know, both these options pretty much end up really, really poorly for the common individual.
Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. I, and, you know, on, on top of the point of the Chinese system, oligarch system, you know, that's also our capitalistic system. You know, uh, especially in beginning situations of a, of a huge, you know, or, or an organization before it gets huge. Uh, you have, you know, the guy at the top who makes the decision so it can happen fast and effectively. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, you make a lot of mistakes, but you, you know all you need is thirty percent right. You're doing all right in comparison to the, to everybody else in the marketplace. So, it, it and then you know as soon as you get to that big stage, that's when it goes back to the bureaucracy. That's when you end up with you need thirteen people to review a presentation in order to send out one ad that went through three graphic designers because you know it had to be shown to be all of these things that we have in all these checkboxes and at the end of the day to publish the one ad was you know probably five times in overhead what it was to actually pay for the ad itself uh and i, I mean this is this is just kind of the same process that's repeat repeat to all industry and all business um and, and i think if we look at history we see a lot of similar examples in our historical records as well and so i guess that begs the question of well how do you fix that I mean, you know, I think it's interesting. We have this running experiment, Bitcoin. Right? We've talked a little bit about Bitcoin. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it kind of embodies some of these problems um, just because you're dealing with selfish actors. You're dealing with multiple party, interested parties who are, would be naturally inclined to game the system. Uh, and, and, you're all, and you're always, you know, having to deal with securing the system from outside parties who would want to take advantage of the system. And, done that perfectly so far since its inception and so i think some of the big takeaways from that are you know decentralized and modular modular in the sense that it can be ran on all sorts of different devices it's broadcast you know via ham radio via satellite you know if you really wanted to you can run the bitcoin algorithm with a pen and pencil uh, or a pen and pad but you're not gonna you know it's gonna take you a long time and you're probably not gonna be able to help the network or anything like that but um you know, it's broadcast far and wide and on multiple different devices. And so now you have this resiliency network. And I think by having that decentralized nature where you've taken the pieces that are really important, you know, the, the ability for it to be secured and the ability for it to generate and do the work that it's meant to do, and you've made them basically bulletproof by decentralizing. And, and that's a really interesting concept that I think we can apply to at, at kind of at least the communal level. Um, 
and combine that with you know what we're already doing in like the corporate world. We know how to market products. We know how to make money. We know how to do things. So what happens if we take all of those oligarch positions, we make all the individuals in the corporation all the oligarchs, and they're enabled by a loose co-op network of technology that that allows them the resilience and allows them the purchasing power and allows them the value to compete in the marketplace by having a greater uh, voice and a greater resource pool to draw from. And then you can have those as decentralized communities that could pop up all around the globe. And then the more that you get, the more that it strengthens the network, the more that it, the network grows in resilience and the greater robustness that the network can come forward. So I, and you know, we, you already know what this is. You know, we've talked a bit about it. It's the Terra Libre project. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of those things where I think we're, we're, we're being pushed to the point where we have to make a choice to kind of go off on these other paths. Otherwise, you know, it's just kind of along for the ride. Well, they are. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well said, sir. Well said. Yeah, it, and you know, uh, as an additional point to that, I, I think it's important to note that it doesn't have to be a cold turkey thing. Right? You you don't have to just switch it all off and all your participation off in one moment, one instance. You know, it can just be one of those things. You just phase things out. It, you know, yeah, you don't want to go off and participate in the system, but you know, Costco is a bit more available than driving two hours to go to the farmers, right? Uh, so you're going to make compromises, but eventually you can you can get to the point where you phase these things out, and then you do get to the point where there's less and less and then you are willing to you know, have the right to have the conversations, the real conversations. So you're not afraid of being canceled. You're not afraid of you know uh, what happened that we saw during COVID and what's happening you now with climate change, right? You know, it's it, 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 it which is wild. Back to your propaganda thing, the, the climate change one that kills me is you know you take a couple of overlays and maps from 20 years apart, and they'll have about the same average temperatures on a day-to-day -day basis, but one will be colored normal like nice map colors in your background there, green and white and blues, and then you have the new ones that are covered orange and red and dark purple and one looks like uh you know this hellscape of of all we're doomed and the other one looks like another another sunday and, and it's it, it's wild and it's the exact same temperatures it's the exact same you know there's more people around there's you know more impact on, on severe events and things but you know from a from a large scale looking out 
we're not even close to the hottest that it's been on this planet. Not even close. And we're also not even close to the coldest season. Mm-hmm. 18, you're out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not just keep housing stable, it's actually drive housing up, <clears throat> right? So the idea is, is I, I think this plays into the whole, you know, you'll own nothing and like it. Because if you think about, if you play this out as a, a thought experiment, um, what happens in a huge city like a New York City or in LA or something like that when property values continue to go through the roof, wages can't possibly keep up, and you end up in a situation where, um, you know, rent is exorbitant, and you, and 
So, and then even if you do own something, property taxes have now gone so far up that if you're a retired person who owns something, you're probably losing for, you know, your investment at some point in this whole this whole escalation thing. And that ends up in a position where now you have this this these, these kind of welfare systems where in order to participate, you'll use the central bank digital currency system that's attached to the little app that you get, and they will and you know part of your acceptance of this is that you will forego your ability to own property. And so I think that's what we're going to see in the coming years. I think, you know, 2025, you'll start to see all this digitized. I think in 2026, uh, it gets really rough. Um, and then after that, I think we, we have this, we're going to see the emergence of welfare cities and states, essentially. And I think you're going to see a lot of this social credit China system kind of be rolled out, not at national levels, but at, at very much regional levels. And we only do strawberry and grape here. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a fascinating thing because you know going back to the beginning of that the demographics how we led into that. Um, uh, my my father works at a at a big uh, one of the fortune companies, and they had a meeting recently on how to interact with Gen Z. Um, because and this is these are this is a corporation who they hire younger but not really like you know, high school young, typically, but all of a sudden they're having meetings on basically how to hire high school students, what, what appeals to them, what's important to them, what sort of workplace environmental stuff do they care about, you know, all these things. Um, and, and it was it directly due, they cited, because we're expecting over the next two to five years, the amount of people retiring in, from the baby boomer generation is going to be such a massive impact that we're going to basically have to take our hiring statistic, which I think is like 25 to 27, and move it down to 8. Yeah, so it, okay.
Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, and then it reaches back into the socioeconomic problem. You know, in again, we hit these, you know, we have these black rocks and we have Zillow and all these other people buying up all these homes and all this property. And eventually it gets to the point where, you know, that socioeconomic divide, you know, it just kind of pushes this off the cliff. Um, and, and, and it happens regionally. It happens. It happens at, at larger levels as well. And, but it's, yeah, it, it's an interesting time because, you know, it's also just like what you were saying earlier, um, you know, we, now they have the corruption so apparent that they have to shut down any voice that just has a counterpoint, even if it's an evidence-based counterpoint. That's how you know it is corrupt. It's when you have all these people out here like, hey, have you guys seen this piece of data that we collected? Oh, you're not allowed to talk. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I was just sharing this piece. No, nope, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. I mean, we even made a ministry of misinformation for a brief second, right? Like, what was that? That was that was pretty wild. I couldn't believe that happened. I, but I was, I was surprised with how fast it, it went away. Well, it just on the surface.
curse is gone. Oh yeah. Every time. Just a few, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I, you know, we're definitely seeing, I mean, we've been seeing the erosion of, of the family and community. You know, you touched on it earlier with the whole keeping up with the Joneses type, type idea. And, you know, that, and then leaving at 18 because, you know, that's when you grew up and that was the American dream and all this other, all these other, you know, weird ideas that got instituted in our, our, our heads, our culture, our, our video games, our TV shows, everything that we watched at the time and, and entertained. And then, you know, all of a sudden, fast forward 25 years and look at the divorce rates, broken homes, you know, all sorts of other stuff, let alone, you know, let alone what we're talking about in terms of, you know, the ability to have, like, the guy with the beat on the camp because everybody's $100,000 in debt. And, you know, it, and it, I did see the same thing in Central and South America. And, you know, it was a necessity. It could, and the reality was is you could not go out at 18 years old and make enough of an income to find a, to have a place. And a lot of those places, it just wasn't feasible. Jobs that an 18-year-old could do wouldn't provide enough money to even have a home, let alone feed yourself for a month. And your phone and all these other things. And so, yeah, you had multi generational homes. And usually, exactly like you said, they were beautiful homes because the addition got put on, the addition got put on. And that's actually how you end up building generational wealth. You know? um, and that was a concept that has been lost in America, at least in my lifetime, uh, which I think is another compounding factor problem. You know, all these things are all intertwined and interrelated with one another. And basically, once you keep pulling on the strings, the end of it's just, you know, it all explodes. <laughs> yeah, it's.
absolutely. I mean, I can recommend it or not. Um, I, one of the first things I learned how to do was web design when I was 16 years old, and I started my first business, um, you know, back during the dot-com boom, uh, which was pretty wild and pretty fun. But I was 16 years old, and I did it with a bunch of friends, so it, it was less of a business and more of where did the money go. But it was still a good time, and I learned a lot of stuff, you know, like a 16-year-old kid sitting out with a business in the, you know, this guy's mansion, he wants to start an online magazine company, right? And this was like late 1998, you know, uh, 97 maybe, actually. And, and he has this whole idea for basically like kind of like what Amazon started out with as the books, but for magazines. And this was before Amazon. Um, but yeah, this guy's a big old trophy hunter and everything. Little missions and Manhattan is meeting a 16 year old kid with you know wrinkled shirt. And <laughs> I was like, oh, this is interesting. But yeah, you know, you'll learn more from those experiences uh, than than can shake a stick at. And you know, also one thing I would recommend is to avoid debt at all at all costs. If you can manage to keep yourself out of debt, um, you're going to be all the better for it. And you're just going to give yourself that many more options once you once you decide what you actually. I would agree. I think that's well said. Uh, in addition to that, you know, you never, I, you had a similar experience. In your 20s, you decided to uproot yourself and everything about your life and just go on this adventure. And I did something similar uh, when I was 20, 24, 25. Uh, and if you can find yourself in a situation to do that, go have an impact. Uh, there's, you'll learn more about yourself in just, even if it's just a six month adventure or year long adventure or whatever, figure it out. Um, you know, these things are actually pretty cheap depending on where you go. You can have all inclusive things if you volunteer at places. There's there's ways to do it economically. Um, and you'll never regret having a great adventure. The Amish, the Amish have, they send out their kids at 16, right? It should be a part of it. Right. And it also gives you a wonderful perspective. Um, you know, you've touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, people are just people. They want to be left alone. They want to have time with their family. They want to go out and have fun. They want to watch their favorite TV show. They want to eat their favorite foods. They want to have those holiday meals. They want to they want to do a hundred things all around their friends and family and fun before they ever want to actually engage in any sort of negative behavior. And that's people everywhere. And I, you know, it seems like something that's easy to say and easy to comprehend, but you know, it's really wild with all the propaganda that we're supposed to. 
you get these perceptions, these stereotypes, all these things about people, especially people in a certain region. And then you go to those regions and you realize that they're absolutely nothing like what you have been told. They're just people, just like everybody, all your neighbors that you grew up with, all your friends, all your relatives, all people. And that perspective is measurable perspective in human life because it allows you to just look at people as people and not as the stereotype, not as prejudice, not as you know, whatever is in the debate is popular. Mushroom bucket. <laughs> well, sometimes those hurt though, you know. <laughs> it helps us find the, uh, the borders of absolutes. So, uh, all right, let's switch gears just a little bit, because that was quite the uh, inspirational to the young ones. I didn't expect that to come out. That was good. <laughs> uh, so, your book, uh, have you published it yet? I know you sent me the digital copy. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's my stipulation too. Like, I'll, I'll give you a chart for free, but you have to let me know what you think. And that's the rule. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah. My one of my existential dreads is always filling out the title line on all those. You know, like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, crap. Well, like, what do I? What do I feel like today? Is kind of the answer, right? You know. Yeah, but authors, authors, a nice one to have. How was your How was your writing experience? Um, you know, was it was it quick? Was it long? What What you take away from it? Did you like it? Did you hate it? <laughs> well. <laughs>
Excellent, excellent. I love it. Uh, no, they, I think you might have inspired a new writer or two with words like that. Yeah, I, I love writing too. I, you know, I, I wrote my entire life and uh, mostly article type stuff was or short story type stuff was what I really was writing a lot of. Um, but you know, you do really encapsulate this kind of creative, like almost just embodiment when you are in that state when it really kind of flows. And you know, I, I've had similar states and other experiences in life, like running like a flow state. Or you know, programming getting really deep into that, and you know, just the beautiful, elegant logic that comes out. And, yeah, it, it's similar to those. But you just all of a sudden you're you're encapsulating like a moment. You're you're pulling from you're pulling from things that you would never, you know, pull upon in a hundred years if you were pressed at gunpoint. But in that moment, the right connections, the right sound, the right you know environment, whatever, just triggers the right little bit of memory. Or it is something that is from almost seemingly you know divinely inspired you know type idea, where you are tapping into something that may be just a little bit beyond you, but it's flowing through you into that moment, and, and you just feel that creative process coming and go. Damn, I did something. I know I did something. And even if I, you know, even if that's just for me, I definitely did something right there because that feeling is a unique feeling. You just can't, you can't farm that out on a on a dopamine drift game every day. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, I like how you say that. I, you know, because that really it's in line with like a hero's journey, right? You know, and, and just like we're all here to to explore, to write, to you know, you can even take it to the biblical. In the beginning, there was the word, right? You know, you have all these different aspects of what it means to be human that really kind of show us that we are supposed to be exploring, creating, and being, you know, involved in the part of it. Right? And, but it's so, it's the least, I mean, it's just until recently, right? Like the whole idea was a starving artist, you know, a starving musician. You know, you're not, you don't make any money as an artist till after you're dead. These are some of those old quips, right? It's, it's very recently that you're allowed to make some money as an artist all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs>
Very well said, Joe. Very well said. Very well said. I would also I would also say personally for me, you know, whenever we go through the, the revolutions of life, the cycles of life, it's oftentimes when we're faced with tragedy and suffering and hardship and fear and pain that those are signs that we're we're not following our proper path. Uh, and, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow for, you know, it was for me when I first realized it. Um, but when I realized it for me, it's like, yeah, the, you know, whenever I did fall back off the wagon, you know, I didn't feel motivated to go for that run. And then that stacked up into four days. And all of a sudden I'm all back again and all these other things. You, you realize that you, by not making these decisions, you build up these these little, you know, in, in Eastern uh, theology, it's called karmic debt, right? You know, and it's not just what I'm doing and talking to you and the words I say, but it is my little, it's the choice of my actions of not going to do, not doing. And eventually we build up this, these karmic debts, if you will, to the point where all of a sudden something breaks up. And for me, it's been a sign that if that's happening, I'm not focusing right on where I should be focused, on my path, on what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, I think there's an old there's an old axiom called say, know thyself, right? <clears throat> and there's a lot to unpack with that. You can continually unpack it every single day. But you know, you touched on a bit of it. Sure, is you know, know thyself, know that thing, know know when you're making, you know, uh, and recognize when the what, what the reflection of those choices are about into your life. Uh, and I think you know we you know pep talks aside, I think you know you've given a lot of pretty solid advice for you know what people you know if you're looking for a path. You know, we've touched about just about everything in this podcast on how to find a path. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm going to say, well, well, we'll call it maybe 35 years of cumulative research. In fact, it all is about nine and a half. Good choice. <laughs> well, there you go, you know. Well, and I, you know, I, I think you are. I think, you know, existential crisis of dread aside, uh, because you know, I, I hate those little unwindings too, right? It's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I just waste, you know, how many countless hours of my life doing this? Uh, am I going to quit? Am I really going to quit? And then, and then you go through the whole silly thing, and you're like, no, well, I'm not going to quit. Like, I'm invested in this. All right, all right. So if I'm not going to quit, why am I going to be grumpy about it? Okay, I'm not going to be grumpy about it. You know, but, you know, like, these conversations, your ability to articulate yourself, your past, what you've done in life is... It's it inspired me to it pushed me over the edge of stand. I've been standing on this podcast precipice for years, legitimately years. And then all of a sudden, George comes up behind and kicked me in the ass and pushed me off. So you've inspired at least one. Of them. So congratulations. Uh, and in your next existential crisis, remember that one.
That's right. <laughs> yeah, brother. Um, well, let's go ahead and call this one today. I have a, I have to run here in a couple, <clears throat> and I know you have to run here soon. Um, but stick around and uh, chat for a sec. All right. Uh, well, tell everybody uh, what you're up to, George. <laughs>